But yeah, I called up Rachel Reeves on LBC. They do a ring Rachel every month where they, because she's the Shadow Chancellor. And by Shadow Chancellor, I mean the person who is going to be Chancellor of Exchequer come the next election. And so every single month she comes on and takes calls from members of the public and answers their questions. Now, you'll remember, if you're a long time viewer of this channel, a few months ago, I did a segment called Rachel Reeves Debunks Herself where I found an article of hers that she wrote in 2010, which was a critique of the fiscal policy of the Osborne administration, where she explicitly said that we should be increasing taxes on the rich, not expecting the private sector to invest in the absence of public sector investment and calling for more redistribution to stop inequality and poverty rising. And what I did is I called up LBC to quote herself at her, whilst obviously not saying that it was her, to see if she agreed with herself. Let's have a little bit of a watch. Helena, hello, what would you like to ask? I've got a quote here from a pretty prominent economist, and they say that Labour needs to provide an alternative for aggressive policies being prioritised by the Conservatives. The banks and those earning more than £100,000 could quite easily contribute a little more, and unless they do, inequality and poverty will inevitably soar in the months and years ahead. Do you agree with that statement? <laughs> The way that I believe that you can reduce uh, inequality, reduce poverty, and actually also improve the living standards of ordinary working people, not in poverty, but struggling to get by, is through growing the economy. Because that is the way that we can ensure that working people have more money in their pockets and we have more money for public services. And one of the real failures over these last 13 years is to grow our economy in all parts of the country, creating those good qualities high paid jobs so she's gonna press the growth button right the conservatives have had access to the big red growth button for 13 years and they've just not pressed it don't know what they were doing rachel reeves she's gonna take the necessary steps to go and press the growth button because she's not going to plan for growth the only real actual plan i've heard from her is her saying well we need to reform to be able to crowd in private sector investment when in the own article that I cited here, she even said there that there should be no expectation for private sector investment to happen in the absence of public sector investment, which is, again, uh, these are all statements that she's previously made that I agree with. I think we should be taxing the rich more. I think we shouldn't be relying on private sector investment. But when she says she wants to reform her way to growth, to get more private investment, this is right wing. This is neoliberal, Thatcherite, supply side, deregulatory economics. That's the only way that you can look at this. The other option, that's what a kind of more Keynesian economist would think, someone who's more kind of on the centre left, is that you would incentivize growth by using fiscal stimulus. You'd use fiscal stimulus to put more money into people's hands, more demand in the economy to be able to incentivize the supply side of the economy to meet stimulus on the demand end. That's what, what we want to see. It's what the, the National Investment Bank plan was, as far as the Jeremy Corbyn manifesto was concerned. That's why growth and interest rates were so low for so long, is because there wasn't enough fiscal stimulus, there wasn't enough demand side policy to get the economy moving again and get people spending money, which is why we've had anemic growth for so long. And those problems have persisted up until now. My priority is to get that economic growth back in our economy, uh, to lift people out of poverty and to have the money we need to invest in our schools and our hospitals and so much else of the public realm. This is identical to what Liz Truss was saying. When Liz Truss said, she was in kind of laugh curve economics when she was saying, well, if I cut the top rate of tax, rich people will take that money and they will invest it into the supply side, which will then put more money in people's pockets as supply grows and demand goes to meet it and the economy grows. And the growing economy will then feed back into better tax receipts. So it's going to be a net gain. Now, we all know this is nonsense because all of the extra money that goes into the pockets of the supply side, in her mind, we know that that doesn't go into new investment because you have the lowest investment in the G20. It goes into accounts in the Cayman Islands, right? It feeds into the asset market without actually building any new businesses, without increasing supply, because we've basically had 13 years of money going to the top of the economy pumped into assets to increase asset values without increasing the supply, which is why our growth has been so anemic. So regardless whether you're Liz Trust cutting taxes to stimulate growth, or whether you are Rachel Reeves deregulating the economy to stimulate growth, I don't see how either of these plans actually meaningfully grows the economy. And even then, 
unless you're growing the economy for the people who actually need to spend it like people in poverty how can you even show me that your growing the economy plan actually decreases poverty and in fact it won't probably almost certainly won't increase inequality due to the mechanisms that i've just explained there about the asset inflationary economy that we've had all, all this time which we'll only see continuing moving forward as well good evening ian um hello rachel yes i feel um, in sort of answer to that last call or adding to it, um, you said you came into politics to change things, and yet all I've heard from you and the front bench is Tory policies for a Tory crisis. True. You're not going to tax wealth. You're not going to do much with income tax. You're leaving the profits of the banks, the water and the energy untouched. I remember very well, because I was born in that period, the Attlee, Attlee government. And what they came in with was a four-letter word, hope. You aren't communicating hope. There is no ambition in evidence in what you're doing. And they had a much harder job than you've got to rebuild the country after the Second World War. COVID is bad. 2008 was terrible. But austerity has to be stopped. And you seem to be wanting to carry on worshipping the Treasury because you are an ex-banker, Bank of England banker, and you don't seem to be in, in making any kind of ambition clear to me as a voter or the public as, as voters, whether you're prepared to rise to these challenges, which are far worse than what we had in World War Two. Get her, get her, Phil. Get her. See, the silent gens, they're good. We stand the silent gen. It's the boomers that we absolutely despise on this channel. <laughs> He's 100% correct. He's 100% correct, right? We lost huge amounts of wealth of this country at the end of the Second World War. Right? So much of it was destroyed. And we had to use fiscal stimulus at a time of you know, high guilt yields, at a time of, you know, moderately high inflation at the time. We said, no, 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 we need to build schools. We need to build hospitals. We need to repair our country. We need to create the post-war consensus that was the biggest period of growth in our nation's history. That was a substantially beneficial economic programme that was advocated for by Clement Attlee and the Labour government of 1945. And Rachel Reeves is inheriting an economy which is in a similar destroyed state that it was after World War II, and she's acting like it's 1997 and they can just coast off of the boom economy that doesn't exist and expect that to fund public services when it won't, because they're not glad they don't have any plans of stimulating growth in the first place outside of this pretty nonsense idea that they can just deregulate themselves to economic growth. And what's your actual question? Well, the question is, why are you employing Tory policies to deal with a Tory crisis? True. I mean, just going back to Helena's question, you know the economist that she quoted? That was actually you. <laughs> uh, well, look, I mean, I want to reduce poverty and inequality. I didn't go into politics. But how do you do that? What are the practical well, things you're that suggesting we can do? You, you, you tax the rich. <laughs> like, you tax the rich and you redistribute it. It's not difficult, right? It's not difficult. In that quote was to tax the banks more and those earning more than £100,000 more. But you've gone back on that. Well, look, the way that I think that we can lift people out of poverty and reduce inequality, as I say, is to get the economy growing. And that has been the missing ingredient these last 13 years. Now, you know, Phil sort of says and, and why has it been missing because of austerity and then you're promising to do the same thing there is no meaningful plan for growing the economy and even then you can't even show us how that economic growth is going to go to the people who need it rather than just get pumped into inflated asset prices oh i'm an, an ex uh, ex banker yes i am an ex bank of england economist and the one thing i learned more than anything at the bank of england is your sums have always got to add up and what we saw less than a year ago was a prime minister and a chancellor who decided to throw that very simple truth that your sums have got to add up out of the window. And the damage that was done in those 44 or whatever it is short days is immense. And that damage was done because she thought the rules of economics didn't apply to her. And so did Kwasi Kwarteng. And we have paid a heavy price for that experiment. But, but what... And I will never play fast and loose with the public finances because the people who pay the consequences of that are ordinary working people and some of the poorest people in society who are now facing higher rents, higher mortgages, almost the collapse of the UK pension market because of their ideological experiment. And I will oh, never do that. This, this idea that you can equivocate between tax cuts done overnight with no OBR forecast and no checking in with the pension funds and compare that to a broad-based uh, set of 
pretty mainstream Keynesian stimulus packages for the economy through investment that are done in a longer time scale with an OBR forecast. And the markets aren't spooked overnight by two lunatics doing things without any warning. These things are not comparable. Because that's what she's doing here. She's essentially saying we can't spook the markets by increasing bond yields by issuing more of them to pay for fiscal expansion. But then there's no evidence that that's necessarily a thing that would happen. And even then, the question that I've asked and mine is about increases in tax rates. And if you're taxing money to then spend on public investment, you're not going to increase bond deals at all because your sums are literally adding up. This idea that you can respond to us and say, well, actually, no, taxation is bad because I want the sums to add up. Well, that, that's how you're supposed to get the funding and by this household budget model to pay for this one in, one out public spending arrangement, which would do nothing as far as overall bond yields are concerned from government expenditure. This is nonsense. And economic stability always has to come first, and it but, will. But if me. you're just going to follow Tory economic policy, what's the point of voting Labour? Well, you know, True. we've said that we would get rid of the non-DOM tax status. I haven't heard Rishi Sunak calling for that. I wonder why. We've said that there would be VAT. And But for both of these tax policies, all of that money is already allocated. The non-DOM tax, you've already told us, is going to be spent on the NHS workforce expansion plan, and the money from the VAT on private schools is all going to go into the education sector, and the policies that you've already said that that's going to fund the one point however billion it is extra tax revenues is going to fund free breakfast clubs for kids not even free school lunches and it's going to pay a dividend payout for teachers for long-term service to keep them in the job so any other funding whether it be for fixing the actual collapsing schools that we know about now or into investment into new green infrastructure or expansion of not just the nhs workforce but in nhs capacity because that's another half of the problem is lack of capacity as well as lack of staff or in new council houses, none of these things are going to happen. Mostly because you're not many promises to do any of these good policies, hence why she's allowed to come out here and say, we've got these tax and spend policies, but that's literally all we're doing. We can't make any other commitments at all. When literal schools might collapse and they're like, mm, we're going to look at the budgets first. You need to find the money from somewhere by your own metrics. And we would put that money where it belongs in our state schools. We've said that private equity bosses, their income should be taxed as income and not capital gains. And we would put that money into our public services. And we've said that we would have a proper windfall tax on the huge... We have another tax policy. I didn't know that they were going to make private equity bosses be paid as income rather than as capital gains. And do you know what would be a really much easier way of fixing this? Just equalising capital gains with income tax. Huge profits that the energy companies are making but, and help with the cost of living crisis. you've also said you're None not of going the to, do any of you're not going to in increase income tax for the so-called rich. You're not going to increase capital gains tax. Um, you're not going to increase inheritance tax. Um, you're not going to introduce, introduce a wealth tax, even though Michael Gove is now speculating about that. that might, I mean, you're, you're more right-wing than Michael Gove. Burn. It's, it's literally not wrong. It's not wrong that Michael Gove was the other day calling for a wealth tax because he recognises because he has one more functioning brain cell than the rest of the Conservatives have zero functioning brain cells. And he's realised that the overinflated asset market can't continue forever and it's ruining the lives of working people who want to actually get on I'm the investment ladder to, to generate, generate wealth for themselves. I haven't heard any Conservative member of the Cabinet saying, do you know what, Rachel's idea is on, uh, you know, cracking down on this loophole for non-doms, which brings in, by the way, three and a half billion pounds a year, or the 1.4 billion pounds you could bring well, in through... Oh, no. that's, not, that's, that's literally no money. Like, that's literally no money at all, like £4 billion. It's good that they're doing that, and it's good that that's going into good public projects, but that's not enough to fix the fact that the entire country is completely screwed up. The number on the non-DOMs comes from HMR, analysis of yeah. HMRC data from the LSE but and Warwick University. But they might well University. just leave the country, so you might not have any of that well, money at all. this takes into account people's behavioural changes, uh, Ian. The Institute for Fiscal Studies have backed up Labour's numbers on how much you would bring in from putting... VAT on private school fees and you could bring in billions of pounds by closing the loopholes which mean that the big energy companies can get out of paying the so-called uh, windfall tax that the government have introduced so you know I'm just not buying this idea well, what's happened that to we the have the same, I'm sorry, that... let me just say this I'm not buying this idea that our policies are somehow the same as the conservatives they're just not but what I will not apologize for is making sure that our numbers add up because unless you can do that it it will be ordinary people and the public services that we rely on that will pay the price for it. 
So the Rachel Reeves who said that quote, the banks and those earning more than 100,000 could quite easily contribute a, a little bit more. That's a very different Rachel Reeves than the one I've got sitting in front of me. Well, look, my priority, and I make no apology for that either, is that I want to grow the economy because it is through growing the economy that well, you think... It's the only answer that she has because she knows, right, she knows that she's been cornered here. I fully believe that she still believes what she wrote in 2010. I still think she believes that. She's cucked herself into this line that we can't spend any more money because she's been told to by, you know, Starmer or McSweeney. But it's, it's just not wrong, the criticisms that Ian is making here. Why vote Labour when the Conservative policies are basically, by only very small metrics, and even a even small amount different? My magic numbers work because I assume record growth in all years. Like, how can we get to the highest growth in the G7, one of Keir Starmer's missions, in the next five years? It's it's field of dreams, sustainably improve people's living standards and have the money that our public services desperately need. So yeah, that was my altercation on LBC with, with Rachel Reeves. And I think I made her come off pretty badly there. I mean, the LBC chat were given her the ringer as well. They were all saying, you know, this is a, this is this is Tory policy. Well, why should I expect this from Labour? So you know, I think I did. A, I think we did a pretty good job in calling out myself and Phil. Phil from Broadstairs. We think we did a pretty good job. If you enjoyed this video, please do consider liking and subscribing. It does help out the channel and the algorithm. And if you click the bell notification icon, it will let you know when I go live and when I upload videos. If you'd like to follow me on social media, my handle is at NoJusticeMTG, and that is Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube. If you want to support my channel in a more financial manner, you can do so by becoming a member for just 99p, by super chatting, or by supporting me on Patreon, with the link is in the description of this video. And hopefully I'll catch you on the next segment.